But, uh, well, hey, everyone. Um, happy to be here today uh, talking about my favorite thing, probably. I don't know. One of my favorite things, but maybe my favorite thing, which is beans. Um, so today, that's going to be the, the topic of choice. And do feel free to hop in if you have um, a question about beans. I'll, I, I, like, I can't tell you everything I know about beans in an hour. Um, that would that would take many many uh, many 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 sessions. Um, so I'm going to try to kind of stick to the highlights and 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 try to distill what I think are some of the most important things to know um, about beans. And maybe if we have a little bit of time at the end. I might uh, sing um, a little song called Greasy Beans that I wrote um, that uh, has uh, made, made some rounds um, places. Uh, so, and I'm also play a little tiny, tiny bit of a fiddle tune. Um, but so what I'm going to do is go ahead and try to share my presentation here. All right. Okay, so many legumes, so many times. Uh, so little, so little time, it's true. Uh, so, beans are one of the most important uh, crops that were grown in Appalachia. I, mean, I think sort of corn is situated maybe as the, the, the primary one um, in that it was so important to the, the beginning of industry, really, in, in the mountains, um, in, in that corn was like, what people fed their livestock. It's what they used to get their hogs to come back in so that they could uh, slaughter them in the fall. Um, a lot of little towns built up around where there were stands um, where, where people um, would uh, keep a pen up, have these huge pens where they pen up tons and tons of hogs. I don't know how they managed it. It amazes me. But, but then we also have beans, which are, to me, in some ways, just as important um, because beans offered all this nutrition. Um, there's just a, a lot in a bean. There's a lot of stuff in corn that's difficult to digest unless you put it through that nixtamalization um, process we talked about where you put soak the corn in lye, breaks it down, and, and, and then your, uh, your body can digest some of the stuff in corn. Um, but beans are a little bit easier um, for you to digest um, in some ways, and particularly if you train your gut, it, it's not quite so uh, uh, flatulary, flatulence-inducing. Um, but uh, beans are really important because they provide a lot of protein. Um, now, people had access to protein, whether it was through fishing or hunting. Uh, however, that wasn't necessarily always a steady supply. Um, when a lot of people think of beans today, they're like, they come in a can, especially the, um, like green beans, and they barely have any seed in them at all. Um, what we might call a, uh, some people call that a bullet when the, the seed that's inside of a bean husk or hull. Um, and they're like really, really tiny and developed. And the sad thing about those like jolly green giant, um, vortex, whatever beans, um, there's a couple of sad things. There's many sad things, but but I think the most crucial one is that in terms of nutrition, they're they're pretty low on the totem pole for what a bean can provide. Especially the old time uh, seeds and beans had the most um, nutrition. Uh, really, one thing you can think about is like the more colorful an heirloom is, the more nutrition that it has. Um, and more tasty it is, often the more nutrition that it has. All those flavors are connected um, to important nutritional bits that we're trying to get out of these beans. Um, so now the old time beans, what a lot of people would grow and eat, um, they look uh, really fat. They're, they're like the seeds are like bulging in there. Um, if you're to look at the song to seed logo, um, there's like a big, big bulging like bean on there that it's like the seeds are just about to pop out they're so um big and that's when they've reached their full maturity in terms of eating them that's when they're the very healthiest they have all this nutrition so if all you're be able to eat which was not unusual for people in the mountains is cornbread and beans um then you really need to be eating those beans on that full side but it also is like you can survive on that um, and people figured out many different variations of basically eating cornbread and beans. 
um, that going back in, into uh, bean bread and, and, and things like that, um, which bean bread's basically tamales with, with um, cooked shelly beans or cooked um, uh, dried beans inside. And we can talk a little bit about that next. Let's see if I press the right button here. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so there's three main species of beans that people grew in the mountains. There's also some other legumes, things that make a bean, um, that are not the not not strictly beans per se, but there's stuff that sometimes showed up in gardens, and it's important to know how they're different. But also, they do have a bean on them, but they're not really beans. But we'll talk about those. Um, but the main kind of bean, like bean. Number one, um, that is the main thing you will encounter. This is usually what canned beans are. Um, this is usually all, almost all the beans you know of are Phaseolus vulgaris, which is kind of a mouthful. All that translates to is like common bean. Um, and that, like I said, that's every kind of bean. So I got a list here of, of just a few kinds of beans. Um, and I will say that wax beans, I've heard that used actually as a descriptor for another kind of bean I'm going to talk about. But this is most of the beans um, that, that are out there. And that's a, like a huge swath of so many different different kinds of beans. And, and like I said, I wish I could go through and talk about each kind of, of bean. I, I need to uh, write that song. Um, but, but, but this is the, the main bean um, that you think about, Phaseolus vulgaris. Um, and then another one, which is, is particularly less common today, that's called uh, Phaseolus coccineus or coccineus. Um, and that is really, most people don't come into contact with this bean anymore, but it wasn't unusual for people to grow it in their gardens. Um, if you have seen this bean, most of the time people have seen like one variety of it, and that's called a scarlet runner bean. It's a different species, so they won't cross. They could potentially cross because species are not always as cut and dry as we'd like them to think that they are. But it has, I've heard that it's happened. I'm not sure with these two species. But um, this is the face Zeolus coccineus. You don't see it that much in the mountains. You see, I have type one there. There's two types of butter beans. Um, now, if you go down off the mountain, um, and you cross over the field pea um, green bean line um, down where you get into the Piedmont and, and, and as you start going east and it gets warmer, more people are growing uh, a totally different species called field peas. Um, but then they're also drying the other kind of butter bean and we'll get to that in a second. But this is sometimes what I call a mountain butter bean and they're really run like they will like run you over. They are really big beans. Um, and they're uh, they're tasty too. You can eat them in most phases, and that's not true of all beans. Um, the common beans you can pretty much eat them in most and in, in every every stage. Um, some of them are a little tough, so they don't make good uh, green beans. They're mo mostly made for dry beans when they're matured. But but the butter beans are really interesting because they make these big beautiful flowers. Like they're just stunning. A lot of people strictly plant them just for that. Um, and sometimes people would plant them in with their common beans, just I, th I think because it was pretty, but also just to attract um, various pollinators and different things to the garden. They really are stunning. Like, I mean, like hum hummingbirds and stuff will visit these. Um, they're really, really incredible. Um, they don't like heat a lot, though. So you tend to plant them earlier than you would other beans so they could take advantage of some spring weather. Um, I think they can take like a little bit of a frost. Um, unlike a uh, common bean, which is, can be kind of puny and, and likes warm, warm weather. Um, but they are really a cool, cool bean. And, and the big, some, I've heard them called mule beans because they're like, they're like this. I don't see like the size of that. They're huge. Um, and, and they have beautiful colors. They don't always look like this black with purple. Sometimes they're purple with black. Sometimes they're white. Sometimes they're brown with specks. And it's just, there's... Some of the most incredible beans I've ever seen in my life are this are, are butter beans. So if you if you hear people in the mountains talk about butter beans, a lot of times they're talking about this species. Um, now there's another one though that people, particularly growing um, 
gardens more in in, in kind of warmer parts down in, in uh, of the south, um, but still up up in the mountains too. It's also something what they call a butter bean, and that's a lima bean. And lima beans are really easy. I don't know if uh, like, there's like a picture of us that's blocking it, but to the right here. Um, uh, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute everyone real quick. I'm hearing some feedback there. Um, so if you see on the right hand side of the screen, there's a lima bean, and the way it's easy to remember Phaseolus lunatus is because it looks like a moon. It's really easy to remember that one, so that's why it's called that. It's like the moon bean, which is just kind of cool sounding. Um, and I love butter beans. I'm kind of obsessed with butter beans. Um, particularly, a lot of the ones people grew in the mountains are little. They they don't they don't get very big. They're they're tiny beans compared to like the lima beans, the big uh, beans you might see in the store. Um, again, they're a third species, so they won't cross. You can plant them right in with your other beans and they will not cross with each other um, but something you want to remember with um, these particular kind of beans is you definitely want to cook them you should cook the other beans too because it helps you be able to digest stuff but but butter beans actually have um, a, a toxin that that needs to be exposed to like 10 minutes of boiling water otherwise it can make you sick it, I feel like the kind of sick it would make you is something that as you kept exposing yourself to it over time it could get you sick um not necessarily that you're gonna get really sick from eating not quite cooked uh butter beans i, I feel like you'd have to uh, take a lot of them <laughs> um but uh in the mountains people would still still grow butter beans a lot of times they're tight they're small in the mountains um and but the little ones like have incredible flavor but you may have seen like on a seed rack something called a Dixie speckled butter pea. And that is a, that is a kind of lima bean or, or, or the other type of butter beans um, that weren't quite as common in the mountains, but are super, super good. I like them too, because um, they're not popular with um, the, um, uh, what is the little terrible bugs? The Mexican bean beetles um, do not, tend to like these very much unless they're like the only bean and then they they seem to not like to eat them um so that that's one thing i, I like about them is they're a little more resistant um so that's a those are the three major kind of beans but the other things that make pods um are field peas or crowder peas um are which are have been grown for a long time unlike the last three which are all um from central or south america um the the field pea is is actually from africa um and they are, are are pretty different in a lot of ways they can sometimes climb particularly some of the older varieties climb but for the most part their habit is is to be uh closer to the ground um unlike uh in the mountains um you know down in the flatlands their their uh, people tended to have more room for their garden so they weren't desperately trying to make as much use as they could i think of the square footage of the garden um, but up here we really need to take advantage of our vertical space because we don't have a lot of horizontal space and so um beans that climb or field peas that climb which a lot of the old varieties like these in this picture do they, they do climb they don't put out tendrils but they're kind of like They'll kind of climb up um, as best as best as they can if, if you give them um, a good trellis to grow up. Uh, but but also was something that people grew again not not as common as the others, but it's important to know these totally different species. You can see that it's Vigna, not Phaseolus. Um, I'm not even going to try to butcher um, that next word on there, <laughs> Unquiculata. Um, but also just FYI, uh, this is the same species as yard long beans or asparagus beans, which um, tend to be grown, um, I think, in South Asia. Uh, and they're big long beans, but they've also been grown in this country for a long time. Thomas Jefferson um, uh, grew some in his garden. So yard long beans have, have been grown for a long time. But, but in case you grow both, they can cross. Uh, and then this is something that 
grown a little bit. I, I don't have a lot of information on it, but it's also a South Asian um, bean. Uh, and and it you can eat the seeds of it, but you really want to boil them and pour the water off, boil them, pour the water off, boil them, pour the water off. There's, it's like pokeweed in that way, which we'll talk about pokeweed in another um, another session. But uh, that's one that sometimes people would plant. Uh, I think mostly just for looks, but you can actually eat the leaves. You can eat a lot of stuff with these, but the seeds themselves, you have to break down some cyanide producing um, things. So as long, as long as you follow this cooking and pouring off process, you won't have that problem. Or you could just eat the leaves or just let them be really pretty. That's that's sometimes I like to plant them um, in between my beans because it confuses the uh, bean beetles. Um, and also just the more flowers you can plant, uh, the better. So um, one thing I think that's really important um, is bean communities. So unlike the way most seeds are sold today, if you were to go into a, um, a store and they're selling seeds, usually when you pick up a handful of seeds, they all look the same. They're like all brown or they're all white and they're fairly uniform. Well, a lot of these older seeds, they have all this variety. They, they might come in seven different shapes and colors when you get the seeds. Um, traditionally, people would pass them on uh, if you gave them to someone as a double handful, like, like this. Um, that, and, and that double handful could be full of so many different looking seeds. Now, that's still in a way, a whole, the whole thing, you wouldn't be right to call it a variety, but those beans have potentially been grown together for like a hundred years, two hundred years. They've been it's it's like it's like its own little city of beans or old home little community, literally, of beans, and they've been grown together and they've crossed with each other. And so the the genetic diversity in that community is like way higher than a a like variety that's been bred to all look exactly the same. And this is the way, these bean communities are the way a lot of indigenous communities, um, and, and what and, and the scientific, I guess, um, term for what this is, is a land race. And land races are not like bred down into a, like a particular type that looks particular way and always comes out the same. The land races were like a community. It was like, there were a lot of, that came out, came out a lot of different ways. Now, the really cool thing about that is not just that you get these insanely beautiful colors. I mean, look at like, look at these. I, I think they're like a painting. Like I could frame, I do frame these and hang them on a wall. What am I saying? But I, they, I think they're beautiful. But also that is telling us something. And it's telling us I have many genes. Like I am diverse and that is my strength. Like we have the ability to survive in let's say a climate impacted world where um, you might have a year that's really dry. Well, some of the seeds in there will thrive in that and, and do well. You might have a year where it's like a monsoon practically, but some of the seeds in there will have genes that'll do well. So it gives you this like real ace in the hole for survival when you have all of this diversity um, whereas if you have one kind of bean and all the beans in it are based one seed, they're basically all the same. Um, it might not have that flexibility. It might not, it might do really well for the one way place it was like bred and developed. But if you take it outside of that, it might totally fail. Um, so this gives you an advantage there. It's also just, I think they just, I mean, it's beautiful. So this is all one bean community that that's an old Cherokee mix that, um, that didn't have a name from the um, feed and seed where they got it out of the freezer that had been given given to them, I think maybe 10 years earlier. Um, it didn't have a name, so I, I named it uh, the Jonah Lossy bean, which is my friend um, who's Cherokee. But uh, it had it's just stunning. You never know what will come out. You know, I, this is all, I planted these all together. These purple beans, these striped ones like October beans, some of them are shiny, some of them are big, some of them are short. And it's it's just, I, can't, I mean, it's so exciting. It's like, you never know what genetic like dice you've rolled. Um, 
and and it just comes out in all these beautiful ways but they're really resilient i i really recommend if you can find a bean community i know a guy who has some um and i sent you some i think i sent a bean community um to everyone oh yeah wendy's got it there yeah 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 so i, I sent a bean community in the mail that's the old time bean community um, and it's rare to find those anymore, and it's really important that we continue to grow those uh, for lots and lots of reasons. But you can see, like, these are all, we, these were all given to me as, like, one variety. It's not like I mixed them together. Um, this is the way they've been grown together for a long, long time. It's really fun. It's really excited to, exciting to grow things this way. Um, and it's important to keep up our land races, too, because we're just carrying more genes into the future and the more genes we have the the more ability we have to react um be flexible to things in the future there's not enough people that have control over our seeds right now it's like there's a few companies um there's just not as many seeds as there used to be and the more that we have the more people grow in their backyards the um the more uh the better chance we give the future as as climate continues to be um, variable, very variable, uh, as as some people call it, a global weirdness, and and things never seem to be predictable at all. Um, so these are really really important. I can't I can't stress that enough. Um, so <laughs> when it comes to beans, you may know this. This is fairly um, elementary, I guess, but in growth habit. We mostly usually break these down into these two um, polarities uh, where you have um, a pole bean or a bush bean. And the bush bean grows pretty low to the ground. It doesn't throw out the little, the little tendrils, which are, are what make the vining part. Um, bush beans are nice because they come in pretty quick. Um, you don't have to put up any kind of um, trellis. Um, they, and like I said, they, they, you get them quicker. The downsides of bush beans, you have to bend over to pick them. That's a pain, especially if you don't have a three-year-old or something to do it for you, um, which when we had 11 kids in the old days, you, you had one, it was great. Um, and by the time you didn't have them, they had three-year-olds. And so there was always someone you could send out that was low to the ground. Um, but the other thing is that bad about bush beans uh, is their yields lower. They're not as big of a plant. They can't make as many beans. Uh, and the other thing that's not great about them is that they get all dirty. Like they, the, <laughs> the, 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 you know, the, the, when it rains, it splashes up on the seeds and, and they're just dirty. You're really having to like wash them more. I don't I even wash my beans usually because they're growing um, above the ground. Um, so, uh, th that's another disadvantage to bush beans. And of course, pole beans, they just started calling it that because they could grow up a pole. They have a vining growing habit. Um, now the thing is like, those are not perfect terms to describe the fact that beans can grow in, um, a lot of in-betweens there. So there's some that mostly grow close to the ground, but they throw out a few, little runners, but they're not that ambitious. If you put a trellis in there, they'll only grow like maybe three feet off the ground. They're not, they, but they still make the trellis. Now those little things are, are what old timers often referred to as bunch beans. So bush beans and bunch beans aren't exactly the same thing. A lot of times the old timey bunch beans, they throw off these, like, like I said, they're, they're kind of like a, they're not all the way bush beans, commercial bush beans that are just like, we do not vine. We only make, you know, babies and then we're done. Um, these don't do that. So um, the, they're kind of a mix. Then you have half runners, which are supposed to not run half as um, high as a regular bean. And now I've done some experiments on my own out of curiosity. I said, I'm going to take this big bamboo pole and I'm going to like, put it on a stake and I'm going to plant a bean and see how high it grows. And I kid you not, the thing must have been like 30 feet tall and it grew to the top of that. It got so heavy that it broke the bamboo, fell over, grew along the ground and then grew up like another bamboo pole and 
And and I think it could have kept going. It eventually was like, well, we, I can't grow anymore. But I mean, someday I'd love to try to see like like what's the max? How far how far can we go? Um, so th there's a lot of variability in how much a bean will run. Uh, but most of the old time beans, most of them are are, are pretty vigorous in how they'll grow. Um, even ones that sometimes they're called half runners, they don't run um, like, uh, I mean, they'll really run you over. Some of them are, are very vigorous. <laughs> um, so, so half runner also is not always a, a clear way to know. Um, a lot of times you just have to grow them and, and find out. But usually you'll rarely find a traditional Appalachian bean that's a true bush bean. You might find like what I'm talking about, these bunch beans, which everyone grew bunch beans for the most part because they came in faster. They came in earlier. So if you plan your bunch beans and you plan in your October beans, um, which I haven't talked about, um, and you plant your uh, greasy beans, let's say, we'll talk a little more about those, um, they come in at different times of the year. And so that was really ideal rather than everything coming in at once, which is like puts a lot of pressure on you to can as many of them can to dry as many of them as you can. Um, this way it kind of kept yielding for you over the season. Um, so, so that's a, a really important thing to, to, to note if, if you're, especially if you're trying to uh, get a lot of your food out of your garden, um, that, that it's nice to plant the bunch beans and the, um, regular uh, pole beans um, be because you'll have that variability. And in these old bean communities, there's variability there too. So you'll have some that are kind of bunch beans. They don't run a lot, some that run a ton. And so they'll come in at like all different times. Your row won't be like, we made our beans and now we're done, which, which beans can do. The bean communities will just keep popping them off um, as the different ones come in. So um, that's pretty, pretty fun. And I just had to put a picture of this Jack and the Beanstalk from 1807. I love it. Um, so this is a big part of the subject, preparing beans. Um, there's a lot that goes into this just in terms, I mean, it's pretty simple, but on the other hand, really makes sure, you want to make sure you have the, like, the right beans for the job. Um, and most old timey beans, though not all, because like I said, there's a lot of variety there, are beans that have strings. And they have good, solid strings, not ones that break up into like three or four awkward strings you have to keep picking out. Like, like it's a heck of a string. So, you know, you, you, you have to take your pocket knife or you take your, if you have a fingernail, and you just break off one end and you unzip it, and then you grab the other and you unzip it. A lot of people are familiar with this. Um, but a lot of contemporary beans do not have a string. I mean, I get the ease of it that you don't have to sit there and 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 unzip them. Um, and I know personally, I'm very bad at unzipping my beans and like uh, getting my wires crossed and putting the beans I want to eat into the same bag as the one as the zippers. And so I end up always having to eat a, a few. Um, but it's it's important um, to know that there are some beans that need to be strung, uh, or like I said, unzipped. I like to call it, call it that. Um, but there's others that aren't. Now the 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 catch twenty two that the, has been made genetically to have these stringless beans um, is that they're often kind of tough when they get big and fat, like I'm talking about, where they had all the the beans or the the seed inside like as big as it can before it'll start to go dormant. Well, at that, a lot of the old timey seeds, like some of these old October beans that I have, the tender whole ones, they, you can eat them like all the way up until the end and they're not tough and it's awesome, but you usually have to unzip them. Now, on the other hand, when you have the regular beans that you don't have to unzip, like, you know, it's great. You don't have to sit it half the time. You might just have to snap them. You don't have to unzip and you can go ahead and straight great to cook them, but it's important to know which is which. Um, I prefer to, to grow a lot of ones that don't get tough just because I can eat them at, at every stage. A lot of old time greasy beans are that way. You, they're, they're tender um, and that's, that's, that's really nice. Um, so, but like I'm talking about where the healthiest, the, the healthiest part of the development of the bean is when it's big and fat on the inside. And that's a very different flavor. It takes some people time to get used to it. Shelley's um, is is the point 
when the plant has started, the, the hull has started to turn yellow. And that's, it gets kind of like floppy. Like if you pick it up and it's not got that, like it's not taut like a bean, it's like, um, that's the point um, when it has shellies on the inside. So that's like the max. That's when the seed will no longer get any bigger and it's just about to start shrinking into a dried seed for dormancy for next year. Um, if you, when you get it right then, that's called a shelly. And shellies are so A, good for you, but B, delicious. Like that's when like the flavor is the best. When you dry the seed, it kind of changes the way it tastes. Um, I love making shellies are really good for making soup beans. They're really good um, for making bean dumplings, which I got um, down here. And bean dumplings, it's just you make a pot of shellies and you throw some dough in there while it's boiling and it cooks the dough. It's just like any other kind of dumplings, but it's with beans. Um, and it's really good. Um, and it, uh, same token, uh, really like bean bread with shellies. Um, and bean bread, I think I mentioned this earlier, and, and I'll, I can share this recipe with you. It's actually a pretty good one. They're basically tamales um, that, that have beans in them as the protein. A lot of times tamales have fish or tamales um, have uh, laroco or they have um, different things in it aside from just the masa. Um, in this case, it's it's the beans that you you cooked. Um, so those are really good. When talking about cooking beans, kind of the rule of thumb for me, if they're green beans, uh, I like to put them in a big pot. And this is my very non-scientific way of how much water to put in a pot. When you're looking down at your at your pot, um, you want to you know fill it up with beans. And then you want to pour water in the pot until and keep pouring until all of a sudden you can like see a little of the water. You don't want the water to cover your beans. You just want to pour it in there until you're like, oh, I can see it. And that's when you stop and put it on the heat. And because um, partly you're wanting to steam them, really. But yeah, then you just sit there and, and wait until they get soft. Um, so that for, for the green beans, that's the way I like to do that. Um, for the shellies, I um, like to use a cast iron pot and, and cover it up. Um, typically, you want to, uh, you don't, shellies, you don't have to soak overnight like dry beans. Um, a lot of times people soak them overnight, and you don't have to do that either. It just takes a lot longer to cook if you haven't soaked them. So um, I like to usually put them in a cast iron pot. Put a decent amount of water just to not not like more than i've talked about with the green beans but not enough that it would take forever to heat up um, you don't want to put too much water in there you can always add a little slowly later if it seems like it's um, getting too low but put a lid on it and then just cook it for a long time um, with both of these methods i suggest putting some kind of oil in there personally i put a big slice of like you know ham hock or or jawbone or something is like super good, but if if for health reasons or ideological reasons, um, if you want to uh, avoid putting animal protein in there, you you can just use like vegetable oil. You can use olive oil, um, but the oil seems to be helpful in it tasting good. Um, but also, I think it actually helps unlock some nutrition that otherwise the the lipids in there help. Uh, bring out the nutrition that you're trying to digest. So it's actually an important thing to have some oil um, in, in there. Um, so that leaves um, one of my favorite ways to eat beans. And this is something very few people have had. And if you have had it, you are uh, like blessed um, to experience uh, the culinary delight that is leather britches or shucky beans. Um, I've e even heard from some people in Kentucky on Facebook uh, that they called them Millers, uh, which is interesting. Um, and you can see this picture here, Leather Britches, uh, that they are like, they see, you can see where they get, they look leathery, right? Um, now, all that's been done there is that they have either taken those and they've set them out on a screen. Basically, they, they pulled the very mature, bean, maybe right when it's about turning yellow or right before. Um, if it had a string, they've 
they've carefully removed the string. Um, some means aren't, are, you know, like we said, stringless. Um, sometimes they take a thread and they thread through them. And so you'll see, see them hanging and they look kind of like little pairs of pants hanging off each other, little leather britches. Um, and that's a very old method uh, for keeping beans. Um, there's uh, even with uh, like English peas, uh, I guess there's, there's even some mention very far back people keeping peas this way. Um, it, it's a little unclear, you know, it might come from multiple sources, people keeping beans this way, but the, the whole thing is you basically dry them into these pant-like things um, that don't look very ed edible, um, whether you put it on a tin roof, some people would hang them in a car, an old car, which I'm sure gives it like a very, very unique flavor profile. Um, but then you take it and you just cook it again. You uh, make sure to put some oil in there. I like to put a, a piece of, of a fatty animal. Um, and then you just cook the snot out of it and they like turn back into beans. It's the craziest thing. You leave the hus the holes on there and it like re -beanifies. Now they look weird and, and they taste different, but it's also, it, it's like something about that drying process and the reconstituting creates a really unique taste. It's like, it's, it's super good. I remember the first time I ever had leather riches and I didn't really know what was happening to me. It was a transformative experience, I thought. Um, but that's a really old, old method. Um, I think once canning technology came around, people didn't do it as much because it can be kind of hard to keep the bugs out of it. What I do is I dry mine. Um, I've even dried them in like a, like a dehydrator before, um, but I dry mine and I put them in the freezer. That's really important. And I recommend that you keep your seeds in the freezer once they're dry too, because it kills the bugs. There's these awful things called bean weevils um, that that can really get into your, your beans. So once you've frozen them, you don't necessarily have to keep them in the freezer. Um, I like to keep my seeds there because they keep better, but you can, you can toss the leather britches in there. Now, um, I would be remiss if I did not mention here that one of the most famous fiddle tunes is called Leather Bridges. Um, I wonder if my uh, original sound is on. Let me see here. Uh, gonna, let's see. Um, all right. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate that really quick. So I'll just go scoot back because it's loud. But this is one of the, the best, best known uh, American uh, fiddle tunes in the old country um, over in Scotland. They call it. Uh, um, Lord MacDonald's reel. I don't know why when it got over here, they called it leather britches. I have a lot of theories, but, um, but <laughs> I don't know if they didn't like Lord MacDonald or what, but so, but this is, this is the tune. bridges <laughs> um, but that is a that's that's the the fiddle tune um, that is connected 
totally directly to um, to to uh, beans. Um, it's 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 a really fun tune. Um, sometime when I get to play the whole thing. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of ways to cook beans. I mean, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg, but these are a lot of the primary ways that people living in, in Appalachia would would cook these. Um, if you have any questions too um, about uh, any of these methods or anything, um, I'll be happy to answer those um, through the email. No, no, no. Um, so, uh, anyways, uh, let's see what we got next here. So, last little bit here is I want to talk about three of my favorite beans. I don't think I could pick three beans. That would be like picking my favorite uh, child. Um, but uh, the three of my, my very famous favorite and and if i could only grow just just a few um i would would probably just grow these um maybe with it with a few others uh fortunately I, i'm not forced to do that and i and i try to plant different seeds every year so i don't we don't lose out on some of these varieties forever um but my next door neighbor growing up um her name was betty sue parker and she was like um a, really awesome lady <laughs> um her uh i think her her parents um came up from I believe they might have lived in haywood county i um I know she's part cherokee uh and these are her family beans the greasy cut shorts uh that she brought up up here um and it's really sweet like whenever her children got married she gave them these greasy cut shorts, which is very traditional, and and that goes back, um, uh, I mean, the, you know, the to the Cherokee that that was that was a thing that that they did. Um, women mostly controlled all the seeds, um, and so uh, they're just like such a good good bean. Um, I remember when I uh, asked one of Basu Parker's daughters if she had. Um, had any you know of the seeds and um i was really uh, excited when when she hooked me up with them and they're really good greasy beans are called greasy beans not because of anything about how you cook them though there's usually a fair amount of grease involved um but it really just has to do with it, the little pods they look shiny you can't quite make it out in this picture but if you were to hold them up a lot of beans are fuzzy on the outside these are actually they're they shine um, on the outside of the pod where they get their name greasy beans um a lot of beans in appalachia are greasy beans it's one of the most uh, popular beans um and there's been some archaeological digs uh in kentucky that have basically pulled up beans that look like they're cut short greasy beans so i think people have been growing these for a, a very very long long time um and they're so good they have like a nutty flavor a lot of times the seeds are white but they come they come in, in a lot of different colors, but that's one of my favorite ones. And that's the one that I planted that that grew up the top of the bamboo pole and broke it and then grew up another one like and never stopped. Um, great bean. Um, I'm privileged to to grow that one. And another one that I really like is the Malaney beans also came from a grandmother, not my grandmother, but um, my friend Jordan Laney, her uh, father, Bart. Um, this is one of his family beans. When the Laneys were displaced um, by the building of the Fontana Dam, um, the flooded, you know, their their farm basically, and and they had to move. They moved um, to McDowell County, and there they Ma Laney continued to grow the bean. We actually came really close to losing this one. Um, uh, in fact, Bart thought it was gone, but when um, an uncle of his passed away, they were cleaning out his freezer and they found the seeds. So they came very close to being gone forever, but they're so good. They don't get really long, um, but they're just a really, really beautiful seed. And one year, and th there was no bean for them to cross with, one year my beans started of his started coming out different colors, so I started to save those two. Um, so mine, um, you can see the little um, container here in this picture has some little brown seeds. Um, 
in it. And, and that's the color they're supposed to be, but they started coming out other ways. And some people would, would see those and go, oh, that's not how the bean's supposed to look. I'm going to get rid of those and just save the way they're supposed to look. But one of the joys of growing heirlooms is that you're keeping an eye out for when things might change um, and mutate, because then you might have a new bean or I, I don't know. So I've, I've, I've saved them both ways, um, but, but uh, they're, they grow the same no matter what color of them I planted. Um, but they're a really great, great bean, um, tender at any stage. Um, and also not, they don't run you over. They, they grow about like head height and pretty much stop. I've had them get a little taller, but, but they're, they're a really good bean. Um, and then this other one on the right uh, is a kind of October bean. Now, all that October beans mean really is that in, they come in in the fall of the year. And they won't come in earlier than that. It doesn't really matter if you plant them early. They wait for like the the daylight to change for for the days. I think to start getting shorter. Um, the, there there's some kind of trigger there because they'll just make all these like beautiful foliage, and you're like, where are the beans? And all the other beans are making beans, and you're really discouraged because you think you planted like a lemon of like it's like like a like a broken bean plant. It's not going to make any beans. And then one day when all the other beans in your garden are like, we've, we've made so many babies and we're dying now. Um, then all of a sudden the October beans just go boom. And they make the prettiest, prettiest beans you've ever seen on the app. The, the hall is like, they're like striped. They look like a, like a sunset or they look like kind of like they're on fire. Um, beautiful pods. And on the inside are these really pretty beans. They can come in, in different, different colors too. Um, there's different kinds of October beans though. Some of them are, are kind of tough on the outside and make a wide flat bean, but they're usually striped. Um, and those you pretty much just eat as shellies or dry beans. But these, and this is a lot of what I see people growing down around Cherokee. Um, these are tender on the, on the hull. So they'll, you can eat them at any stage. Uh, and they're just a really, really good, good bean. Again, they grow. I, I don't, grow a whole lot of bush or bunch beans that um because i my garden's not that big um but uh that's that's one of my my very very favorite ones um so very last thing i will be remiss in not giving some seed saving advice so saving the seeds for beans is super easy one of the easiest plants to save the seeds for they have a closed flower so they tend to pollinate themselves so you don't have to worry about them crossing so much you still want to give some distance you want to grow them like right on top of each other if you're trying to preserve some varieties um but but people do different things some people grow big long rows and they just don't save seeds from from maybe about 10 feet where where they the beans like meet they make sure to not save seeds there that's one thing you can do. Um, I, I say maybe about 15 feet or plant a bunch of a different kind of flowers or different species of bean in between them. So when the bees fly, they go into a lot of different flowers before they come back so they don't cross. Um, but uh, the, the really good piece of advice I can give is if you look at this picture, you'll see that the, the hulls are all yellow they kind of turned a little little brownish. That's when they've got to that bendy, floppy stage. That's when, if you're saving seeds, a good time to pick them is then. And the reason why is because that will help prevent bugs from getting into them to a degree. Um, also, if they dry out on outside and then it rains, it can hurt the seed because they'll sprout. And a sprouted seed isn't going to work next year. <laughs> um, it's not going to keep. It doesn't want to be frozen. It's alive. It's not in dormancy. So I usually pull them um, like this when they're floppy, but I, unlike in this picture where I'm pulling them out for shellies, these are actually, I think some, this is some kind of greasy bean, but it's not a cut short. All a cut short means is the beans look squared off. It's a little cut short, um, but leave them in there until on the inside of your house, the beans dry out. That's really important. So you want them to get dry, kind of like that picture of leather bridges. So then when you open them, the beans look real shiny and they're nice and dry and they've gone dormant. If you open them like this, the beans don't dry out right and then they won't 
germinate as well. Um, the you can do it. I've done it, but but they seem to be a lot happier if they dry out in the pod, and then you shell them. So that's 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 my advice. Pull them when they turned yellow, and then um, dry them in the house, and then shell them. And you don't even have to shell them uh, if if you know if that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> you can you can wait until when you pull them out of the freezer. Just make sure everything comes room temperature. That's important. You don't want to open up a bag and have like all this cold air come or warm air come into your beans that are cold because they'll condense and that'll that'll hurt the future germination. So don't do that. But um, set them out so you you can shell them later. Uh, you don't you don't have to do that. Um, and if you're wanting to shell a lot of beans, I like to just sit there. It's very satisfying and open them and hear them go blink 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 like that. That's that's a that's a great joy of mine. But if you if that sounds aggravating, <laughs> um, or if you have a ton of seeds that you're, that you're wanting to either shuck them out so you can, um, or shell them out so that you can keep them, you can eat them for dry beans or whatnot, um, you can put them in a pillowcase, uh, and you can just like put a whole bunch in the pillowcase and you just like beat the snot out of it, and then they'll come out and 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 they'll just pull at the bottom. You just keep doing it, and then they'll pull at the bottom of the of the bag and then you can pull the other stuff out and and just pour them pour them out and do it that way but i like i like to open it because sometimes you'll open one and and it'll be a completely different color it will have mutated or it will have crossed um and and sometimes the uh, sometimes you you'd be like mm, i'm gonna save those and plant them by themselves and see if they come back that way they might i've got some really pretty seeds that i've uh, essentially been able to create my own variety because um they came true and or sometimes you plant them and they look just like the bean head before but it was still fun um so i i i highly recommend looking through them because and and then too you might notice like well that seed doesn't look very good i don't think i want to plant that one um but uh one last little thing field peas are a different species they don't really have as closed of a flower and they'll cross so um you want to give them a lot more of a distance than you would just the the phaseola stuff. So the like the field peas again. That's the um, the vigna unculata one. The field peas, crowder peas. They're they're different. So um, I would do a little different with them. Well, so that's that's it for today. Um, which time? Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. We have just enough time for me to sing my song. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm going to subject you to that. Uh, let's let's see here. Okay, so let me pull. Oh, nope. I'll do that. I mostly have it memorized, but it would be good if I didn't forget verses. Okay. All right. It's a little hard to read there. I may have to stop and scroll down. <laughs> But this is a song that I wrote for a seed swap that I got invited to. They wanted me to sing a song for the grand opening of the Boone uh, Seed Library. And uh, they said, yeah, come sing a song about gardening. I said, OK, yeah. And then it comes around to the day of, and I realized, oh, no, I don't know a song about gardening. <laughs> um, this was several years ago. And so while I was driving up from Winston-Salem to Boone, where I lived at the time, um, I jotted down on a on a piece of notebook paper um uh the lyrics to this song so it's not something that i labored over greatly um so we'll see here <clears throat> when i was a young un, i knew very little and at a church supper, I sat down for vittles, and I tasted a legume 
was so serene, love at first sight with the greasy me. Now these beans were fat, like they could explode, and down my gizzard more and more flowed, so tender and flavored with last fall's hog fat. Pass the beans, I'll add more of that. Crazy beans, crazy beans, crazy beans, crazy beans. Oh, how I love crazy beans. Amongst all the beans that I've ever seen, none can compare to the crazy beans. Now, for greasy beans, the best way to sow is at the foot of the field corn up which they'll grow. And make sure your corn's at least two feet high, as these beans can climb down near to the sky. Phaseolus vulgaris, a fine species, got many splendid varieties, like October beans and goose beans and the turkey crow, but the greasy bean beats all I ever saw. Greasy beans, greasy beans, oh how I love greasy beans. Amongst all the beans that I've ever seen, none can compare to the greasy beans. Now for the Yankees and uninitiated, I'll tell you something I long have hated. That's when fools pick greasy beans far too young. They should be fat and full and then unstrung. And when they lay me down to rest, pile greasy bean seeds all on my chest. Wait, no, that'd be a horrible waste. Plant them yourself and have you a taste. Greasy beans, greasy beans, greasy beans. Oh, how I love greasy beans. Amongst all the beans that I've ever seen, none can compare to the greasy beans. All right. So there, there we have it. Um, thanks, folks. I um didn't realize I hadn't sent on last class, so I will make sure to upload that one and send that one. I upload this one too. Uh, but before we hop off of here, does anybody have any any questions? Um, uh, I think I might have muted everybody too, in case anyone does have any questions. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I I wish you the very best um, in in bean planting and and bean harvesting. And uh, I'll also say beans can keep in your freezer for a long time. I planted beans that were 30 years old and they all sprouted pretty much. So, like, you know, don't feel pressured to grow the beans that I gave you anytime soon. Um, but uh, also don't feel pressured. Like, I have, I, I planted a lot of those. So, <laughs> you're not the last person with them. Um, but uh, but they are really special and I hope that they will bring um, lots of, of uh Lots of tasty joy and into your life. Um, but yeah, so that's it for today. I will um, share that and I'll also send um, the links. Uh, we didn't get to do Sharon's interview last month. Um, some things came up, but I will uh, share um, the link for her a video we're going to do with uh, an interview we're going to do with her and also an interview that we ha have that coming up with Jake S. Miller, um, who is a really cool uh, guy like me. He's a seed saver and musician. Um, and so looking forward to uh, having him on here, but thanks everybody. Uh, and enjoy the weather. I hope it's not too, too hot where you are. Um, but I'm going to go jump in the pond. So have a good one. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> thanks. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.